so uh, my name is João Rezende. That's my name. That means John in Portuguese. I'm from Brazil. And I'm a trauma surgeon here at St. Mike's. Uh, I work uh, with trauma and acute care surgery. Acute care surgery um, is uh, we treat patients who come in with emergencies that are not trauma. So patients who have acute appendicitis and, and uh, perforated bowel for reasons that are not considered trauma. And uh, I do research here at Lika Shing. I'm a, a, a surgeon investigator. And my line of research is uh, very much related to the inflammatory response to trauma and surgery in general. Uh, I'm originally from Brazil, like I said. Uh, I was a chief of trauma of uh, one of the largest trauma centers there, we would see more than 10,000 patients a year. For you to have an idea, St. Mike's sees around 600 patients a year. So it's a completely different environment, the place I come from. And there will be a World Cup in a few weeks, and I hope we win. Okay. <laughs> so I hope everybody's enjoying their lunch. Uh, I have to apologize for some of the videos that I will show here, but for the high school students, particularly Emmanuel and Nick, it's going to be very important to see this. <laughs> uh, and uh, I want to make this uh, lecture very pleasant to everybody, and you guys can interrupt me at any time to ask questions, uh, and uh, we'll take it from here. Is that okay, Michelle? Okay, go. Push on the uh, stop uh, chronometer there. So this is what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. I'm going to first mention a little bit of what is inflammation. Then we're going to talk about uh, the body's response to inflammation or uh, a correction. The body's response to insults. And insult here does not mean calling one a bad word. It might have some effect on it, but insult here means uh, surgery. It means a trauma. Uh, a car accident, it means taking out your gallbladder electively, it means pulling out your toenail if you have ingrown toenail. Uh, uh, and this is what I'm calling about, uh, uh, in, I'm talking about when I say insult. And you have controlled insult, which are uh, surgeries that we can plan. So a patient comes to St. Mike's with uh, gallstones and we're going to remove the gallbladder laparoscopically. So that's a controlled insult. The surgeon will do the injury in a very limited way so that the effect on the patient's body will be very minimal. And, now, and we're going to talk about uncontrolled insult. Imagine you're crossing 401 in an inappropriate place and an 18-wheeler runs over you. That's uncontrolled insult, correct, Emmanuel? Yep, okay, very good. So that's the first thing you need to know. And then we're going to talk about uh, the response of these types of insult and what does inflammation cause on your body uh, when it is overwhelming, okay? We're going to talk a bit about the experimental aspects of what we do to try to control this overwhelming inflammation. And we're also going to talk about what we do clinically nowadays with our patients to control this uh, massive inflammatory insult. That's what we're going to do today. So inflammation. What do you know about inflammation, uh, Nick? Bruises. Bruises is some, it's inflammation. Tell me another inflammation that you know. Cut get infected. What? How does the cut become when it gets infected? My God, this guy is a doctor. Very good. So do you know that uh, more than two million years ago, they already th those animals there, they are petrified, already did some type of inflammation. Their body responded with some type of inflammation. Okay, very good. But you're still doing well, even though they already knew that two. Thousand years, two million years ago. Two thousand years ago, a guy named uh, Aulus Celsus, not the Celsius 
of the temperature thing. This is a completely different guy. Uh, first, describe exactly what Nick did. Are you related to this guy? <laughs> no? Okay, very good. So he described this. What did you tell me about inflammation, Nick? Uh, it has heat, it becomes warm, it becomes red. Didn't you tell me that? It swells, you get pain. You forgot one thing, though, function loss. If you get a hammer and hammer your, your thumb, you're going to have all those things, and then you're not going to be able to use your thumb, correct? So that leads to function loss. So that's what this guy told us about inflammation 2,000 years ago. How, how things evolve, huh? Unfortunately, uh, even though this was a brilliant description of inflammation 2,000 years ago, it's not worth it too much for us today. This is what inflammation is. So now, from now until the end of the lecture, I'm going to start from this point here. And I'm going to try to explain to you guys everything until there. If you sleep, I'm going to wake you up. No, I'm kidding. So we're going to go over that chart of all those arrows and stuff in a much different way so you guys can be attracted to the lecture here and not sleep on me. <laughs> so uh, inflammatory response to trauma, what do we know about it today? Well, we know that uh, the inflammatory response to trauma or any stress, so any surgical stress, even psychological stress can set off an inflammatory response. When you're very anxious, like I was yesterday, to give this talk to you guys today, I went to bed at 3 a.m. and only got some sleep at 5. During two hours, I was turning around thinking, how am I going to get those high school students not to sleep in my lecture? So, uh, so that's a stress. That's a, it set an inflammatory response. My heart rate went up a little bit, and we'll, see, we'll talk about this. But one thing that we know about inflammatory response is that it is equivalent to the extent of the operation, the infection, the trauma, 18-wheeler hitting you is going to mount a huge inflammatory response and injury, obviously, correct? So that's the first thing you guys have to keep in mind. Inflammatory response is equivalent. It's comparable. It's, uh, it correlates with the extent of the injury, the extent of the stress that's set on the patient's body. Another thing that we know about inflammatory response is that uh, it's built into the patient's defense mechanism. So remember that I showed the, the, the trilobite, I don't know how you say it, the trilobite, that little phosphos, fossilized uh, animal there. Uh, it, they already had it. It's embedded in their system. So that's a survival. Uh, it's a, uh, something that we need to survive. Correct? Like I said, uh, it maintains body function when life is at risk. So the inflammatory response and the response to injury that we're going to talk about here maintains our body function when our, when our life is at risk. And it starts within moments of the insult. Anything that causes harm, like I said before, or invasion or injury to our body will set off this inflammatory response within minutes of, of it starting. Let's talk about uh, a minor inflammatory response or a minor metabolic response. When you, who has ingrown toenails? Every one, at least one here. Oh, okay, very good. So ingrown toenail, when we do a surgery, uh, oh, and by the way, Nick, ingrown toenail will have all those things when it gets inflamed, it'll have all those things that you talked about, correct? Redness, swelling, pain, loss of function. So when we do a, a surgery for ingrown toenail, we'll set off an inflammatory response that is minimal to our body, but it is like a miniature of uh, the same inflammatory response that you get when you have a bigger operation, correct? So remember, like I said before, the inflammatory response is equivalent to the degree of tissue destruction. 
Okay, now let's go to something a bit more intense here. So let me get this right. Go here, escape, and go here. So this is a uh, surgery that is being performed. Oh my God, it's in Portuguese. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, that I should have blocked this out. <laughs> should I unplug this? Okay. Okay. So, okay, so this is a surgery on a patient who had a liver cancer and we're doing the resection of the liver uh, segment here. Uh, and uh, we're cutting the liver, after we isolated the vessels that induce a lot of bleeding, we're cutting the liver parenchyma, we're cutting the liver tissue. Like I said before, when a surgeon does an op a planned operation, this patient came to my clinic, I saw the patient, and then we took her to the hospital to perform the operation. When we do the operation electively, planned operation, we're able to go through the tissues in planes that bleed very little, that cause very little harm onto the surrounding tissue, okay? So now I'm going to accelerate the video a bit. See how the bleeding is controlled? There's a little bit of bleeding there, but there's not a lot of bleeding. Over here on the upper side, you see the diaphragm and the heart ble uh, beating inside the chest. So at the end of the procedure, what we have is a resected segment of the liver without, uh, without any major bleeding, a well-controlled operation, and this patient will mount an inflammatory response, just like the one that, similar to the one that had the nail removed, but it's much more controlled than what we'll see in, a, in our next video. So here we have the liver resected, uh, the tumor is gone, and uh, at the end we have this that we had to take out from the patient. So the tumor was actually invading the spleen, uh, and it was a big operation. This patient stayed in the ICU for, 24, uh, for 48 hours, was discharged to the floor, and, and then went home within seven days. And postoperatively did, did just fine. So we'll talk about how her body responded to this operation next. So that's an elective surgery. Like I said before, uh, uh, the body, this patient's body will mount an inflammatory response. So in a nutshell, this is this, the response that this patient's body uh, produced. This response is regulated by her, the patient's uh, central nervous system. Who has heard of the hypothalamus? Have you heard of hypothalamus? Okay, very good. And it's also uh, determined by local inflammatory mediators that were probably set off on the area that we did the operation on. So the patient's abdomen set off an inflammatory response that went up to the patient's brain and set off another response that we're going to talk about now. So it's much more complex than what Nick said and then what Celsus said 2,000 years ago, correct? We owe much of what we know now of this metabolic inflammatory response to Dr. David Cuthbertson. He's a Scottish uh, uh, pharmacist uh, and physiologist who studied this response here. So uh, Dr. Cuthbertson, he uh, dev uh, devised a model of uh, how our body responds to injury. There is a phase that he called the ab phase, and this phase follows by another phase called the flow phase, and those two phases have the objective of bringing the patient's uh, condition from normal after go, the patient goes through all these uh, aggressions and all these insults that I talked about to again to a normal uh, uh, position. So the patient travels through the inflammatory response 
going through these two phases. We're going to, like I said before, quickly talk about each one of those phases. The first phase, which is called the ebb phase, is a phase that we can compare to a shutdown of our computer. When you shut down your computer, do you lose all the memory that's in there, uh, Emmanuel? You, your, your archives that are saved are still there. So the computer doesn't die, does it? No, it just shuts down. Exactly the same thing happens to our body. It's like our body needs time to focus on what matters most, okay? What matters most. So the ebb phase, and if you look at the Webster's Dictionary, you'll find that ebb means abatement, retreat, recession, going down, calming down, uh, uh, retreating inside itself, correct? So our body focuses on what is most important. And this phase lasts for approximately 24 to 48 hours. It cannot last much longer than that. If it lasts much longer than that, you will lose everything that you saved. You lose your life, correct? So it lasts around 24 to 48 hours. The goal is immediate survival. Does this remind you guys of anything that I said before? So uh, the inflammatory response, the initial goal is immediate survival, correct? Oops, like this thing is the goal is immediate survival. Uh, so when we talk about immediate survival, our body needs to uh, protect the main organs that we need to survive. Have you seen anybody survive without the brain, without the head? Very rare, correct? Without the heart? Extremely rare. Without the lungs? Unless you're on a ventilator all the time, you can't. You, you, you still need the lungs even if you're in the ventilator. So those three organs, heart, lungs, and brain, are the focus of our body during the ebb phase. Everything else, it's re, uh, put in second plane, okay? We're gonna pay a price for that though. Uh, like I said, uh, because everything else is put aside, we have a response as if we are dying. Our body temperature goes down. Our heart function goes down. We don't need to perfuse our legs. We don't need to perfuse our gut. We don't need to perfuse our kidneys. So we don't need a very intense heart function. The oxygen consumption goes down. We're not walking. We're not doing anything that will waste oxygen, correct? And our urine production goes down for two reasons, basically. One is that the kidney is not getting enough blood, so it cannot filtrate urine. And the other one is we want to preserve as much fluid as we can because the main problem here is bleeding. Remember the operation? When we cut, even though we go in the very perfect planes to try to achieve our goal to remove that tumor, there is some bleeding. And that sets off hormonal responses that uh, makes our body try to retain as much fluid as it, as it can. Okay, so that's the ebb phase. Emmanuel, 24 to 48 hours later, what happens? Very good. You're a good guy. So the flow phase happens, okay. The flow phase happens to take us to the normal status that we had before the operation. When I walked into the hospital, if I'm not very sick, I was practically normal, correct? Okay, very good. So the flow phase has another goal. The flow phase now is like spring cleaning. We need to clean out all that mess that the surgeon did on that abdomen, correct? There's dead tissue there. Even though I cut precisely where I wanted, there's still some collateral damage, a little bit, but there is some dead tissue. We need to start uh, getting this thing here healed, and this phase then uh, kicks in. Again, it is controlled by local inflammatory mediators and by the central nervous system. What happens in this phase? This phase is a little bit longer than the ebb phase. Obviously, it's a phase of starting to put things back together, so it can last as long as it, uh, not as long as it can, wants, but it, can, it should last a little bit longer. It's always easier to remove something than to assemble something. Have you ever dismounted your bike, your bicycle? Isn't it easy to just unscrew the bolts, and then have you ever put it back together? Takes longer, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. So that's the same thing with surgery. 
you, you're a quick guy. You, you don't think it does, huh? OK, very <laughs> good. So uh, what happens in this phase? If we think about it, it's exactly the opposite, or very much the opposite of the previous phase. Body temperature increases. We need heat to make things function better. When you want to accelerate a chemical reaction, what do you do? You heat it up, correct? Oxygen consumption now increases. We are repairing tissue. We increase the production of glucose. The reason why we increase the production of glucose, our body increases the production of glucose, is basically twofold. Uh, one, we have resistance to insulin. So the insulin that, we, that induces hypoglycemia doesn't work very much in this phase. And, uh, th and that's very important because uh, injured tissue loves glucose. It feeds on glucose to repair itself. And the leukocytes, the white blood cells, you know what the leukocytes do? Uh, okay, they kill bacteria. They clean up the area where there's dead tissue, the white blood cells, okay? So the leukocytes, they also feed on, on, on uh, glucose. So unfortunately though, to obtain the amount of glucose that we need, and even if we, had, even if we offer enough glucose to repair all this uh, from the external by giving it to the patient's body, unfortunately, because of this response, our body breaks down muscle mass, muscle, to obtain glucose from the muscle. And that, if, that's why if this phase prolongs too much, you get so much muscle mass destruction that you actually become overly sick or overly uh, uh, depleted of muscle mass and you actually end up dying. Your diaphragm is muscle, your heart is muscle, correct? So all those things are being chipped off a little bit by uh, our, this response to produce glucose. We also uh, break down fat, which is important. We bake down flat, uh, fat to make fat turn into glucose so that we can feed whatever is going on in the t injured tissue and we can feed the leukocytes. Our heart function goes up. Is this pretty much the opposite of what we talked about in the ab phase? Yeah, very good. After the seventh day, that uh, flow phase that was destroying muscle mass, diverting all its energy to form glucose so that glucose can provide fuel for the leukocytes, for everything that's happening, it starts to slow down. And it's actually now it starts, it's starting to repair the tissue that it had to destroy to obtain glucose or fuel for the, uh, repairing the tissue where it was operated, correct? So this phase lasts, it starts about after the seventh day, and it lasts longer. It can last up to a month in some patients. And uh, depending on the degree of the destruction that was caused. An ingrown toenail that you pull out, very little, very short, correct? You, you don't lose any muscle mass. But a surgeon like that lady who had the, the liver cancer, she was uh, a bit sick, uh, she needed repair uh, much longer than ten, 10 days or after the seventh day. In this phase though, urine production increases. Uh, hey, Alan, why do you think urine production increases in this phase? Because you no longer need to like, retain blood volume as much as bleeding. Number one, give me another reason. That's a great reason. Bleeding has stopped, correct? What else? Didn't you, didn't you uh, retain a whole bunch of fluid? That's right. Well, so now you gotta let it out or else you'll be like the Michelin man, you know? Right. Yeah, okay, very good. So exactly, that's another reason. So this is all commanded by hormones from that inflammatory response or the central nervous system that we talked about, very good. And now the kidneys are very well perfused too, so they can work, correct? The factory is open or the, the dumpster is open. And, he, and the kidneys need to get rid of all the stuff that the leukocytes had to eat and, and debride and everything. Uh, muscle breakdown stops and we actually start to get some muscle buildup. So if you wanna go back to the gym and start doing some 
uh, weights, you actually see that, oh, it increases. But before this phase, you, can lift, you can't lift anything because you're so weak. But. And uh, other functions also normalize. OK? Very good. Now let's go to something a little bit more intense here. Uh, now I go. So this is a patient who came in with a gunshot wound to the chest, right at the, uh, close to the nipple line. And uh, the patient had some vital signs when he came in, and, uh, but then the patient stopped. His, uh, the vital signs uh, disappeared. There was no more heart function. So we're, this is the uh, pericardial sac. It's a sac where the heart stays in there. And that's a clot that's coming out of the pericardial sac. And then people say that clot in the pericardial, uh, blood in the pericardial sac doesn't clot. So this patient right now, he's dead. You're gonna see his heart, and it's barely beating. See it beating a little bit? See? Can you appreciate that the heart still beats a bit? So now we have to find the injury and correct the injury. So now I found the injury and I'm going to put a... So I found the injury and I put this... Let me stop here. And I put this clamp, see this clamp here? I put that clamp on the injury. So it was an injury to the uh, uh, left, uh, to the right atrium. So the patient had an injury to the right atrium. So we put a clamp on the injury, but the patient's, the heart, function, the heart stopped. So the patient is dead. So I have to do internal cardiac massage. So I'm trying to get him, whatever blood he has in his body, I'm trying to get it circulating. So I'm do, if you think about it, I'm doing exactly what the ab phase would do, correct? Provide flow to the brain, to the lungs, and to the heart. So we carry on with that. And this is why we do trauma surgery. So it's a very tense moment. And the click that you're hearing is the click of this instrument hitting the uh, retractor. And now we can't do anything about it. We have to get him back to life. And that's what we're doing. And put in your watch. This seems to us, it seems like two hours. It's only a few minutes. And right now then, his uh, vital functions are being maintained by my hand pumping in his heart. If I stop there and leave it for four minutes, he'll be completely dead. So now his heart starts to move a little bit, but still not enough, see? So we still have to do more. And now let's accelerate this to the time of victory. And now he came back. Look how beautifully it beats, huh? This is like scoring a goal in a hockey match in the Olympics. And now we are tying the, the ventricle, uh, or in the World Cup, or in soccer, whatever you decide. <laughs> Now we're, we're tying it. Look how the heart beats well, strong, full of blood. Okay, so we're all happy. We had high fives and everybody was happy, but we don't know that this is like the nemesis of the trauma surgeon. Let me do escape again. Let's see what happens. Here. So uh, the inflammatory response on that guy, what do you think? Is it bigger or smaller than your toenail, Susan, when, oh. huh? Probably a lot bigger. A lot bigger, yeah. And it's bigger than the patient that had the liver resection as well. Much, much bigger. This patient was dead. For a long time, there was no perfusion to any of his organs, correct? So now we're going to see what that means. So remember that when I said that the response to injury involves uh, the central nervous system as well as the inflammatory response that arises from the 
area of the injury. And like Susan said, this area is huge. It's a big problem. His whole body is un unperfused for a long time. So it's as if he had a whole body ischemia. And indeed, uh, uh, trauma, traumatic hemorrhagic shock is associated with an intense inflammatory response. And we know this for many years now, but even in 2013, it, to see how even though 2,000 years ago inflammation was brought up by Celsius, and Nick here brilliantly described exactly the same thing, it's still a matter of concern nowadays. So uh, what, we, what, what will this patient go through? So this patient will go through the ab phase, just as before. This patient will go through the flow phase. And if everything goes well, if the inflammatory response is not too big, he'll survive and he'll make it to his home and, and work and everything. Correct? This is the perfect scenario. Obviously, the ab phase on this patient will be much more intense. The flow phase will be much more prolonged, but he will survive and, and like he did and uh, go back home. Uh, however, the inflammatory response in a patient like that is much more intense than the other ones that I presented. Inflammation, in a patient who bleeds, for example, inflammation is a main cause of coagulopathy. So we want, when you're bleeding, you, we want your blood to clot, correct? So here we go, the first bad uh, uh, result of having too much inflammation. You get coagulopathy. Your blood doesn't clot. And that's exactly the opposite of what we want, correct? You want the blood to clot. Another important player on everything that I'm going to say now, from now on, is a cell, a, white, a blood cell, and it's a white cell, it's a leukocyte, uh, called the neutrophil. The neutrophil is a very important player in everything that I'm going to say from now on. And uh, just to illustrate here, we have several types, different types of cells in our blood, in addition to the red cell, which is the one that uh, most people think that the only thing that we have. So, uh, and, and it's so important that uh, if you consider this uh, research in inflammatory response, in trauma, the most studied cell is the neutrophil. And uh, this is a recent study, theoretically, showing that the neutrophils are very important. And this is what happened in terms of inflammation now, only inflammation now, uh, in the area of the injury in, in our whole body. Uh, the first thing that we'll see is that we see a production of something called cytokines. So cytokines are like messengers that will uh, set off the alarm for the neutrophils to start their action and to destroy bacteria, to repair tissue, to uh, 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 start creating a, a more favorable area for uh, wound healing. So everything started off by these cytokines. There are many other uh, substances, but these are uh, very important ones. And particularly IL-6, IL-1, and TNF-alpha. And we showed in, in previous studies that after hemorrhagic shock, you, you do have increase in IL-6, increase in TNF-alpha. And uh, one of the main things that these cytokines do is the neutrophil uh, is in the vessel, in the blood vessel, correct? Uh, Nick, you agree with that? Yes. It's in the blood vessel. But the tissue that, that heart, the patient's heart there, and the other one, the liver, is there's blood vessel getting there, but it's outside the blood vessel, correct? You could see it outside. So the neutrophil must get from the blood vessel to the tissue where the injury is. And it, to do this, it needs the information set off by those cytokines. So the blood is constantly pushing the neutrophil forward. And uh, let's see, oops. The blood is constantly pushing the neutrophil forward and we'll see it flow inside the vessel. Uh, 
there is a neutrophil flow inside the vessel. It has to decrease the speed to stop, correct? So did you see these little white uh, spikes come up? Let's see the white spikes again. Oops. The white spikes will come up and act as if it were uh, decreasing the speed of the neutral fuel. Look at that. Pay attention to the white spikes. It'll go. It should. <laughs> okay, the white spikes went up. So it decreases the action of the neutral fuel, the, the flow of the neutral fuel. That's, they roll and then they actually decrease their speed. They need to decrease their speed because, Nick, where is this? Where are we looking into here? Inside the blood vessel, yeah. correct? And the neutral fuel has to get out of there. So to get out, it has to stop to get out, correct? Okay, so what makes these little spikes here go up are actually the cytokines. Other organs, other substances do, but the cytokines are a main player here. So the neutral fuel rolls, the spikes go up. This is in that patient that had the heart injury, yeah? And the neutral fuel stops. Okay, and now we go to the next, uh, this way. Now we go to, hmm. <laughs> Hello, I don't know how to get out of here. Okay, so, now we go to the next uh, phase, which is the neutral fuel has to get out of that vessel and go to the injured area, correct? Okay, so now let's see how this does, this goes. So it stops, it gets through and goes to the injured area, okay? Very good. So do we have proof that neutral fuels go to the injured area, Alan? Tell me one proof that white cells go to the injured area. It has, ha it has happened to you. Yeah. What is it? Pus. When, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pus. So exactly. This is the, a patient's abdomen. This patient had uh, uh, perforated colon. And there's pus. See the syringe there? I'm aspirating pus. That's neutrophil with fluid and all those things that I said that are like you need to, on, when you get to the flow phase, you need to do the spring cleaning. That's what you need to clean out, correct? And this patient evolved to the <coughs> middle slide there, which is better than the first one, I can guarantee you. You already have more organized uh, uh, cleaning there. It, it's, it seems messy, but it's still better. And do you all agree that the third slide seems a little bit more appropriate, more organized? Yeah. On the third slide, you have dead neutrophils because it's yellowish. But you also have, uh, uh, our body was able to isolate all this inflammation and infection that was systemically and spread all around, spread all around. Now you have isolated into a certain area. That makes it easier to deal with the problem, correct? When you have, uh, let's say you're carrying a, a bag of beans and it, it falls on the floor and someone tells you, try to pick it up for me. A whole bunch of beans everywhere. What do you do first? You first get them together and then you start picking up. You don't go to one little bean there, and, correct? Very good. So our body is not stupid. It does the same thing. And uh, what, does the, what does that neutral field do at the area of the injury or at the area of the surgery? Well, it starts to produce a whole bunch of substances mm -hmm. to do this spring cleaning, to do this debridement, to, do, to kill bacteria. And previous research done by uh, our group showed that it, it actually does this. In the, when you look at uh, the lungs of patients who had uh, uh, injury like that, there's infiltration of neutrophil, all these little black dots here are neutrophils. And you, are, you actually have production of something called elastase. It's, elastase is a substance that uh, de uh, destroys tissue, particularly dead tissue, so that it provides as if it was dissolving the tissue to be removed from that area, just like those pictures before. 
And the neutrophil also has a, a substance called myeloperoxidase, which does the same thing, in a, uh, uh, but it actually kills bacteria as well. So those two things are produced by the neutrophils. But the neutrophils are so well adapted to protect our body that they can become quite nasty. Look at this here. So the neutrophils also produce oxygen reactive uh, reactive oxygen species, or the free radicals. Hey, Alan, look at that. You know what else produces free radicals? Radiation. Whoever smokes here is doing a good job producing free radicals, just like the neutrophils. But we know that smoking is not good, correct? Yeah. So free radicals, too much free radicals might not be good. Uh, air pollution produces free radicals. So this is something uh, very important. But is this all bad? You think that the production of free radicals, elastase that destroys tissue, uh, malloperoxidase that kills bacteria but also injures our organ, is this all bad? No. Like I said, we need this to survive. So it's a big fat no. It's not all bad. All bad. Look what this process did. This is a patient who had multiple gunshot wounds the abdomen, I couldn't close the abdomen and all that. In this area here, neutrophils were acting, producing free radicals and all those things. And it brought him to this phase here, which is much better than this. Do you agree? Yeah, of course. So it's not all bad. So inflammatory response to trauma is not bad. It's only bad when it's too much. Too much is not bad. And this is an example of it. So this is the, uh, that patient that had the uh, perforation of the bowel of the colon. So the patient had a problem in her abdomen, perforation of the colon. The neutrophils went there to do that, but they went all over the body. The cytokines were all over the body. And unfortunately, her lung sustained collateral damage. And look how the lung is. We're going to see in our last slide how that lung became, OK? So this is also can be compared to friendly fire. We are trying to solve the problem, but we are dealing with very, uh, very toxic substances, correct? That will lead to collateral damage. Usually what happens in trauma is that, and Ori published a paper on the two hit models in trauma, uh, Dr. Rostein. Uh, Usually what you have is you have the trauma, like that patient who had the stab wound, the gunshot wound to the heart. You have an inflammatory response up to this line here. Then you have a moderate immunosuppression. The patient becomes more susceptible to infection because uh, there is a counterbalance between the pro-inflammatory and the uh, anti-inflammatory. But if everything goes well, the patient survives and goes back to his normal life before the trauma, correct? However, if you have a, an intense inflammatory response, like here, the patient goes to what we call multiple organ failure. This intense inflammatory response is called systemic inflammatory response syndrome. In general, in trauma patients, the mortality from the syndrome alone is around 10%. But if you add, add infection to it, the mortality goes up to 60%. So it's a very serious business. That's why we, dis we uh, study this. And what do we do about this then? How do we prevent this exacerbated inflammatory response? That's all, that's all the question that we need to ask now. Huh? So we try to modulate or moderate the inflammation. And how do we do that? Uh, unfortunately, some strategies, even recent strategies, if you look at this paper, it's from 2013, <coughs> have not been successful. Uh, trying to block the cytokines, remember the TNF alpha, IL-1, and IL-6? If you block those to an extent where they're so suppressed that there will not be a, any inflammatory response at all, what will that do? That will give, uh, create, a, in our body, a susceptible media for bacteria to, to thrive, correct? It'll, it'll create in our body uh, a response that is much less than we would need. 
So that's what these studies that try to block those cytokines, uh, uh, they didn't uh, bring any benefit. If they sometimes were harmful. The patient was more suscept suscept um, susceptible to infection. So what are we doing experimentally now to end this? Uh, one of my lines of research is to try to block or decrease the collateral damage provoked by the free radicals in, the, in our system of a patient who had that heart injury. And to do that, I'm using hydrogen. Why am I using hydrogen? Well, one reason that I'm using hydrogen, and it's a pretty serious reason, is because there, we have abundance of hydrogen. There is a nebula called Great Orion that is 50 billion light years from Earth that has 80% of hydrogen. So I'm thinking about the future, correct? I can obtain hydrogen from there. So I'll never run out of this. But more importantly, though, <laughs> is because hydrogen is a scavenger of free radicals. And what does it do? Look how interesting. So you have up here in this formula here, you have free radicals. If you add hydrogen to this formula, in a nutshell here, you end up forming water. Is water good? Yeah, when you're thirsty, even better, correct? So that's why we're using hydrogen. And I have a hemorrhagic shock model where I'm going to resuscitate the animals using hydrogen-enriched uh, uh, saline. Uh, remember that we said that the inflammatory response uh, is in the central nervous system, but it has a, it talks with the periphery. So that talk is done by afferent neural pathways, nerves that go up to the brain. Tell the brain, hey, this, I got shot in the heart and I'm bleeding to death here. So that sets off that inflammatory response. So we act on that, we act on that area as well. There's a nerve called the vagus nerve the vagus nerve goes in our neck here and goes down to our whole body. And the vagus nerve, uh, actually, when it's stimulated, it actually decreases the inflammation. It decreases the inflammatory response. So that if you stimulate the vagus nerve, you can actually blunt the uh, production of cytokines and, and whatnot. So it does this by blocking a receptor, uh, which blocks something inside the cell and decreases TNF alpha and this other substance here, but in, at the end it decreases inflammation. So it would be good to implant a, a stimulator on the vagus nerve of that patient that had the heart problem in the ICU or that lady that had the perforated uh, uh, colon in the ICU and stimulate the nerve so that her lungs wouldn't be as bad as it showed, correct? Okay, well, we tr we're starting on that. In animal studies, we show that groups that have the vagus nerve stimulation decrease IL-1. Remember that pro-inflammatory cytokine? And it actually also increases IL-10. IL-10 is anti-inflammatory. It's the antagonist of IL-1. So it works well. Huh? We don't know how to measure this, how much we have to stimulate, but it works well in humans. We haven't done it. So what do we do clinically now? So if you come to St. Mike's with a uh, gunshot wound to the heart, just like that patient, what do we do to minimize your uh, collateral damage in, in, in two minutes? Uh, remember that we said that uh, the inflammatory response is equivalent to the extent of the operation, extent of the injury, extent of the infection. Well, in terms of the injury, the trauma, we can't act on that. You got shot on Church Street and we weren't there to try to hold the bullet or decrease the chances of you getting shot. But in terms of what we do in the hospital, we can, we can do. First, when we do our operation, we have to be as skillful as possible not to cause more harm, not to destroy more tissue. Second, we, we actually act on the bacteria. We give you antibiotics to decrease the, remember the inflammatory, inflammatory response syndrome goes from 10% to 60% mortality if you have infection. We have to protect you from that. So how do we decrease the injury, the, uh, the 
damage that was done by the gunshot wound. One of our main goals is to stop the bleeding as soon as possible. So this patient here got shot in the, in the, in the mouth here, in the chin, and he, he was bleeding to death. And he was, his heart was about to stop, so we introduced some balloons inside the wound, and we inflated the balloon in there. The balloon uh, squeezed the vessels that were bleeding, and he stopped bleeding. And this patient was taken to the ICU. 48 hours later, we brought him back, uh, did an angiogram to see if there was any bleeding. There was no bleeding. We decreased the pressure in the balloon. Everything was well. We removed the balloon and did the repair. So this is called damage control. This is another situation. This patient uh, had a splenic, uh, splenic laceration. It took a long time to come to the hospital. His spleen was shattered. So we had to operate on the patient, remove the spleen, and then we had to interrupt the surgery right there. Because if we kept going uh, to try to treat other injuries that were not life-threatening, we would probably kill him. Because remember that the inflammatory response is proportional, proportionate to or uh, equivalent to the degree of the operation, to the degree of injury. So we interrupt the procedure. Again, another case, a patient had a gunshot wound to the iliac artery. There was a piece of the artery is missing, and, but he, he was bleeding to death, and he would lose his leg. So we introduced a catheter inside the, the proximal end, the end that's coming from the heart, and then we introduce it to the distal end, the end that's going to the leg, tied it over with a, with a black silk, took the patient to the ICU, he was uh, given blood, given antibiotics, and supported. And then we took him back and did the repair of that artery. So those are the situations that we, what we do today clinically to, to try to decrease this massive inflammatory response. That's already happening, but we can make it even worse. And that has a result. Papers, uh, studies show that it decreases mortality. If you use this type of uh, strategy, damage control strategy or resuscitation, the mortality rate decreases significantly. What else do we do to these patients? Who knows, have you heard of ICU, intensive care unit? Okay, in the intensive care unit, all we're doing is supporting the patient during those, all these phases so that we can get him through that up, down, and then back to normal, correct? We do that by giving the patient drugs that will make the heart function better. We keep the patient warm in the ICU. Don't they go to hypothermia in the beginning? And hypothermia has bad consequences to some extent. If the urine uh, stops, if the urine output uh, decreases, if the patient stops producing urine and the kidneys shut down, we do dialysis on this patient. So we're waiting for the body to regain function, correct? So this is a great advance that medicine has brought to us. The, in in uh, previous years, many years ago, these patients would be dead because there would be no way to recover from such an extensive uh, inflammatory response. Again, we, we intubate the patient and we ventilate the patient so the lungs are maintained, lung function is maintained. And we do it so good that look at this patient's lung. That's the patient that I showed you before that had a colon perforation. She went from this to this, correct? So the inflammatory response subsided. We supported her in all these areas that I talked about, and the patient recovered. Any questions? Nope. Thank you, audience. <laughs> Thank you.